Happy Sabbath. Isn't God good? Brett was telling me just a minute ago another Jonah sermon. (laughs) We need a Jesus sermon. (laughs) Well, hopefully, this will get you to Jesus and help you to understand that. the way he works through work through Jonah hopefully he'll work that same way through us if you can turn to Jonah chapter 4 and I'll be reading that I'm going to read it in the Good News Translation. Jonah was very happy, unhappy about this and became angry. So he prayed, Lord, didn't I say before I left home that this is just what you would do? That's why I did my best to run away to Spain. I knew that you are a loving and merciful God, always patient, always kind, and always ready to change your mind and not punish. Now then, Lord, let me die. I am better off dead than alive. The Lord answered, What right do you have to be angry? Jonah went out east of the city and sat down. He made a shelter for himself and sat in its shade waiting to see what would happen to Nineveh. Then the Lord God made a plant grow up over Jonah to give him some shade so that he would be more comfortable. Jonah was extremely pleased with the plant. But at dawn the next day, at God's command, a worm attacked the plant and it died. After the sun had risen, God sent a hot east wind, and Jonah was about to faint from the heat of the sun beating down on his head. So he wished he were dead. I am better off dead than alive, he said. But God said to him, what right do you have to be angry about the plant? Jonah replied, I have every right to be angry. Angry enough to die. The Lord said to him, This plant grew up in one night and disappeared the next. You didn't do anything for it, and you didn't make it grow. Yet you feel sorry for it. How much more, then, should I have pity on Nineveh, that great city? After all, it has more than 120,000 innocent children in it, as well as many animals. Jonah 4, 1 through 11. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Heavenly Father, we ask you to help us. Help us as we expound upon Jonah 4. Send your Holy Spirit to be with us, guide us, direct us, and forgive us of our sins. Help us, Lord. We need your help. Just like those in Nineveh. Send your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. We need your help. We ask all these blessings. Yes, you was most powerful and precious and holy name. Hallelujah. There is a book called What's So Amazing About Grace, written by Philip Yancey. In this book, which captures your attention from the beginning, tells us of a prostitute who figured out one day that she could make more money 
renting out her toddler daughter for one hour than she could make for the entire night. She did this for a while until she encountered a bunch of Yeshua loving Christians who did not come to her in condemnation. Who did not look at her with disgust and disdain. But who came to her in the way Yeshua filled with grace. They talked to her of what it meant to follow Yeshua. Then at the end of explaining what Christianity looks like, they then said these words, we want to invite you to our church. We would love to have you come to our church. Then she said these words, church, church, why would I ever go there? They would make, only make me feel worse than I already feel. This woman's words were tragically true. She had sadly but accurately diagnosed most churches in our country today. Tragically, most churches are known for a lot of things, and yet grace ain't one of them. Church, church. Why would I ever go there? They would only make me feel worse than I already do. Church in America is known for a lot of things, and grace ain't one of them. I say this is tragic. I say this is sad, because if you understand anything about Yeshua, he was known for his grace. It was the calling card of his ministry. In fact, in John chapter 1, verse 15 through 17, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, and of his fullness all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 1, 15 through 17. You follow the trajectory of Yeshua's ministry. You will find that he was a man who incarnated and embodied grace. In John chapter 4, he sits down at high noon with a woman at a well. A Jewish man didn't talk to Samaritan women. Jews went around Samaria, but Je Yeshua stops in Samaria and sits down with her in broad daylight. You read texts like Luke Chapter 7, Yeshua was at a party at the religious rites house, the Pharisee's house, the moral majority's house, and he lets a prostitute wash his feet. Grace. He lunches with a tax collector like Zacchaeus. Grace. And he saves you and me. Grace. Not because we grew up on the right side of the tracks, not because of the degrees we have or don't have. By the way, what good is your degree going to be in heaven? Not because of the choices we make, not because mama is saved, not because daddy was saved, not because you deserve it, but he saves you by a single solitary gift called grace. The problem with most Christians is when God saves us for any amount of time, we develop spiritual short-term memory loss. We forget that the very thing that got us into the kingdom 
is what keeps us in the kingdom, grace. Church family, wouldn't it be awesome if this church in Sierra Vista, Arizona, would be known throughout the world as a church of grace? People who don't know Christ could come here, and before they come to Christ, they didn't get the memo on how long their skirt should be. They didn't get the memo on when to stand. They didn't get the memo on when to sit down, when to clap, and when to shout. They didn't get the memo on all of that. Unfortunately, I hear that we have members who castigate people who don't know better. I invited some people to one of the SDA churches in this area. The people that I invited were treated so badly, they left soon after they arrived. People who just want to come in here and get a word, what we need to remember is what Yeshua did to the Pharisees, what he did with the money changers at the temple. Now hear me, Grace. Grace is not ignorance. Grace is not patting someone on the back and justifying their sin. Grace is not patting someone on the back and saying, you do you. Continue to have that affair. Continue to tell those lies. You just continue to do you. No, that's not grace. What did John say about Yeshua when he saw him? For the law was given to Moses, but grace and truth came by Yeshua. Grace without truth is compromise. Truth without grace is condemnation. Truth without grace is condemnation. Now hear me, all of us are naturally weighted one side to the other. Some of us are so truth-oriented, we are like bulls in a china store. We just keeps it real, and you run over people. Need I remind us, Paul says, yes, speak the truth. Package it in love. Many times when we run over people, we don't have truth. We have perspective. When you go to confront someone, you don't have truth, you have perspective. What you're trying to do is get truth. The way to get truth is to not make statements. One must ask questions. What makes grace so phenomenally special is that grace is not blind. It sees it, yet it covers it. Grace covers. Grace sees the sin, yet it forgives the sin. Grace sees the failure, yet it forgives the failure. Grace acknowledges the misunderstanding happening. Grace acknowledges the incident, yet it still says 70 times 7, I forgive you. Why? Because we fundamentally understand that the epitome of hypocrisy is, is for me to have been saved by grace, but to withhold the grace to others. God did not save us to be cul-de-sacs of grace. He saved us to be boulevards and avenues, not dead-end streets. So I want to make a clarion call to remind us of grace. Now, if there is one word that sums up Jonah, chapter 4, it's grace. As our passage opens up, Jonah is ticked off. Now, we'll come back and expound upon why he is ticked off. But our passage falls right on the heels of God showing monumental, a monumental move of grace. He sends Jonah to these pagan people 
who have been oppressing the people of God. He says, Jonah, I'm going to use you as a vessel of grace. Jonah walks into a, the city stinking, smelling like fish, yelling. Yet 40 days and you will be destroyed. And what does God do? He sees these people respond to the message by faith. They repent, they relent, they fast and pray, they sit in sackcloth and ashes. God says, you know what? You have responded to the message by faith. Much better than my people. Since you have done this this way, I will give you special. I will give you agape grace so that God pours out his grace. One scholar tells us that what happens in Nineveh was the greatest revival in human history. 120,000 people and cattle. Church family, when I got this, to this part in this sermon, I had to stop and pray some more. Stop, walk around for a moment or two. Sit down and stare at the screen. I had to repeat what I had just typed and shook my head. I wanted to stop writing. I didn't want to continue anymore with this message. I had to say, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. We have failed you so very much. We had a magnificent moment to show the world your power. And we just like Jonah, mad at you, each other and fearful. Instead of showing this world, we have a God who is mightier than any virus, any government, any conference, or any church or people. He is our creator, our savior, our redeemer and liberator. If you had the faith the size of a mustard seed so someone else gets credit for having faith enough to stand. Many of our churches still close. What a travesty. Alvin Toffler said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Some of us refuse to learn, unlearn, and relearn. So why do we need to learn, unlearn, and relearn? Good question. Now back to Jonah. So God pours out his grace on this city. Now the question is, how did God pour out his grace on this city? Thanks for asking. Well, he use, uses Jonah. How did he use Jonah? Why did he use Jonah? Grace. Each of the chapters in the book of Jonah records a significant, a significant lesson the prophet had to learn. These interruptions parallel in many ways the lessons God consistently and patiently tries to teach each of us along the way. In Jonah chapter one, he learned the lesson of God's providence and patience. We can run far, but we can't run away from God. In Jonah chapter two, he learned the lesson of God's pardon. God forgives those who call upon him. In Jonah chapter three, he learned the lesson of God's power as he saw a whole city and cattle humble themselves before the Lord. In Jonah chapter four, he has one more lesson to learn, perhaps the most important one of all. 
Here he had to learn the lesson of God's pity, that God has compassion for the lost sinners like the Ninevites. And his servants must also have compassion. Incredibly, Jonah brought a whole city and cattle to faith in the Lord. Yet he didn't love the people to whom he was preaching. Yet he didn't love the people to whom he was preaching. Jonah took God's repeated pity on his own life for granted. While he expected instant extinction for the sinners in Nineveh, how often do we expect God to treat us one way while we pray? He will treat others according to an entirely different standard. Apply Yeshua's words in Matthew 7:12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. To Jonah's situation and ours. The grace we expect from God, we ought to ask him to give to others. God interrupts our lives with grace so that we can now become vehicles and vessels of grace to others. So that when God interrupts you, the question is always, God, what are you trying to do? Not just in me in the interruption, but through me in the interruption. One pastor's confessions. He said a few years ago, I did lunch with the prostitute. Now don't let your minds wander, church family. He said there was also 10 others at the table. She was an ex-prostitute. At the table, they asked her her story. She says, I was addicted to heroin. I was a woman of the night. One day a man comes up to me wanting to buy an hour of my time. We go to the hotel and in the hotel he says straight up, I don't want anything to do with you in which way you think. He says, I just want to buy an hour of your time to tell you about Yeshua. So he tells her about Yeshua. She comes to faith in Yeshua. She then goes to rehab. By God's grace, she gets off of heroin. You know what she is doing now, church family? She started a ministry to get prostitutes off the street. Saved by God's grace into church, off of drugs, off the street. What did this woman understand? She understood God interrupted me that night. He saved me by grace. I can't sit on that grace. I got to take that grace and share it with someone else. Listen to me, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Stop sitting there, church family, thinking you are ready to ascend into heaven when you are no earthly good. There is stuff God has delivered from you from. There is stuff God has saved you from. There is stuff God has brought you through. And when God brings you through something, don't just say he brought you through. Reach back with the same grace that brought you through and ask to be used as an instrument to pull others through. So that Jonah is a vehicle of God's grace. 
Are you with me, church family? Because by his grace, he brought Jonah through. Now watch this. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4 of Jonah. Now you would have thought 120,000 people and cattle get saved. You would think Jonah, stinking or not, would be doing the holy dance for the next two days all over Nineveh. Jonah is happy. Jonah is not happy at all. Turn with me to our text for the day. Jonah 4, 1 through 3. Jonah was very unhappy about this and became angry. Now then, Lord, let me die. I am better off dead than alive. So he prayed. Lord, didn't I say before I left home that this is just what you would do? That's why I did my best to run away to Spain. I knew that you are a loving and merciful God, always patient, always kind, and always ready to change your mind and not punish. Now I know I live in Arizona and some of these kids here, the way they talk to their parents is downright terrible. However, when I grew up, we didn't talk to our parents or any adult out of anger. My parents would say, we will slap them words right back in your mouth. I don't know how you do it in your house, all sophisticated and all. You have the timeout ministry. You all let your kids talk to you any old kind of way. I didn't grow up in a house like that. We didn't talk to mom and dad out of anger. We didn't like the consequences of doing that. My parents were not into us trying to express ourselves in, in that way at all. But watch this now, dear brother. Jonah is angry at God. Not once did God castigate Jonah about his anger. God questions the validity of his anger. Do you do well to be angry? But not once does he tell Jonah that he is wrong for being angry. I want to bless you with this parenthesis in this sermon. First thing I want you to understand the reason why God doesn't slap Jonah's words back in his mouth. It is because anger is not a sin. Go with me to Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. This tells me it's possible to be angry but to, but to do so with what the Bible calls righteous indignation. Did you know one of the attributes, attributes and characteristics of God is actually wrath? If anger was a sin, God would not be holy. Did you know that Yeshua got angry? In Matthew chapter 21, 12, Yeshua went into the temple of God and didn't just turn over tables and money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He threw out all that sold and bought in the temple. You think he was ticked off? If anger was a sin, Yeshua was not an acceptable sacrifice. In fact, anger is oftentimes an indicator light of a healthy relationship because anger expresses what I care about. Fellas, if you, if you do something and all your wife says is, okay, okay, go sleep at a hotel. Hopefully there's no grits in the house. 
The unhealthy person in the relationship is the person who stuffs and stuffs and stuffs and never expresses their anger. That's not good emotional health. In healthy relationships, we are able to go there without being disrespectful. I'm not going to talk about your mama. I'm not going to slam no doors or cuss you out. But you need to know that when you do this over here, it ticks me off. That's a healthy relationship. Now here is the other thing. God can handle your anger, but God is also omniscient. So he knows how you feel, whether or not you tell him. So please notice God ain't tripping off of Jonah's anger. He's questioning the validity of his anger. So, he quest so the question is, why is Jonah so angry? Thanks for asking. Jonah 4, verse 2. So he prayed, Lord, didn't I say before I left home that this is just what you would do? That's why I did my best to run away to Spain. I knew that you are a loving and merciful God, always patient. always kind and always ready to change your mind and not punish. Jonah says, God, here is why I'm angry. I'm angry because of your grace. This text teaches us three very unsettling truths about grace. First unsettling truth I want you to understand about grace is this. Grace is insulting. Jonah is upset not because he received grace. In chapter 2, he was praising God for grace. Jonah is okay when he gets grace. Jonah is not okay when people he didn't like gets grace. This is many of us. We want grace when it comes to us, but not to the person that I don't like. Jonah's problem with grace is people he don't like getting grace. Why is that? The reason why grace is insulting is that you and I live in what is called a meritocracy. When I use this word called meritocracy, I'm talking about people who live in a society that is for the most part predicated on earning. It is an equation society. Our society is a meritocracy. It funda fundamentally says you do good things over here, you get good things over there. One example of this is when you go to the airport and you walk into the Delta section, you won't stand in a standard line. You go through the expedited line for the Sky Club people. You go through that line really quickly. Then you will go through the, the security real quickly. Once through the security, then you go to the Delta Sky Club if you have time. You are a member of the Sky Club. Never paid a dime for the Sky Club, but you will be able to sit there, enjoy free Wi-Fi, Biscoff cookies, have a bowl of soup, all for free. When that's over, you have already checked your ticket at the free business class upgrade back to Arizona. Didn't have to pay a dime for it. Now, why all these special treat treatment? They didn't give you this special treatment because you just wanted to, want, they just wanted to bless you. They gave you the special treatment because you are a million miler 
from Delta. You have diamond status with Delta Airlines. Delta Airlines is fundamentally saying, you treated us well over here. You have used us as your exclusive carrier over here. You have accrued these miles over here. You have done good things over here. So we are going to bless you with good things over here. That's the meritocracy. Many of you have gone to great schools, great universities, gotten degrees, the MBAs, the EDDs, the PhDs. Now you are living in the most desirable places. Many of you are enjoying a wonderful lifestyle because if I just read your story enough, by the world standards, you have mastered the principles of meritocracy. You have done good things over here. Now you are reaping wonderful things over here. Now here is the problem with grace. Grace doesn't operate that way. Grace does not play by the rules of meritocracy. In fact, grace blows the equation up. Grace says you did bad over here, but I'm still going to bless you over here. Grace oftentimes is like monopoly. You accrue wealth, build, house, buy houses, hotels. You, you can be very competitive. Some land, someone lands on your property and they have to pay you all this rent. You can bankrupt people. You negotiate deals. You just love monopoly. But here is one thing that you can never do at the end of Monopoly. You can't take Monopoly money and go to Bank of America. They would look at you like you were crazy. The teller of Bank of America would tell you, Monopoly money only has value in the kingdom of Monopoly. But outside of that kingdom of monopoly, that money has no value. Your PhD brings value in the meritocracy of the world. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, your PhD don't mean a thing. Only grace does. Your PhD doesn't bring value. Your virginity doesn't bring value. The moral choices you make doesn't bring value. Your zip code doesn't bring value. The only thing that matters is grace. That's why the Pharisees were so ticked off with Yeshua. What do you mean? I have gone through all this schooling, spent all this money, memorized all these Bible texts. I've done all these things and here you are saying, this prostitute is closer to the kingdom than I am. Grace. So what grace should do is to humble you. Stop acting like you're all that. That you are better than people because you drive a certain car. Because you live in a certain neighborhood. That's like bragging that you have the corner suite on the Titanic. Everything we have in this world is firewood. Any given moment, God will say, give me back my breath. And the only thing that matters is did you know Yeshua? Not did you know calculus, but did you know Yeshua? We call that Grace. Now for the ouch moment. Jonah is angry. He is angry because God has blessed people he does not like. Who has he blessed? People of Nineveh. Nineveh is part of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire was one of the most violent empires ever. 
They skinned people alive. They called it flame. They came up with crucifixion. That was Nineveh. They oppressed the nation of Israel. Jonah was mad because God had blessed their oppressors. Nineveh is the social equivalent to the KKK or the Nazi regime. Democrats or Republicans, depending on which side you are on. God says KKKs. God saves KKKs. What does God do? He asks Jonah, do you do well to be angry? Let me help you understand something about God. When God asks questions in the Bible, it ain't because he's lacking information. Let's just get that out of the way. God's not trying to get information that he doesn't have. He is trying to point out Jonah's sin to him. Now what happens here is masterful. He says, oh, you are angry with me for blessing people who don't deserve it. So you are in sin. So I'm going to appoint a plant while you are hot. Do you see this, church family? You are hot. So I'm going to appoint a plant to give you shade while you are hot all up in your sin. I'm going to bless you. Now the punchline. Jonah 1, 10 through 11. Jonah chapter 4, verse 10 through 11. The Lord said to him, this plant grew up in one night and disappeared the next. You didn't do anything for it, and you didn't make it grow, yet you feel sorry for it. How much more, then, should I have pity on Nineveh, that great city? After all, it has more than 120,000 innocent children in it, as well as many animals. What this text teaches us is that God is not only the God of the oppressed, he is also the God of the oppressors, which is the second unsettling truth about grace. Hear me now, church family. God did not just die for Israel. He died for those people in Nineveh who were oppressing them too. God didn't just die for your ex who committed adultery and bankrupted you. He died for you both. God didn't just die for the abused. He died for the abuser too. God didn't just die for Eric Garner and George Floyd who were choked to death by police. He also died for Daniel Pantaleo and Derek Chauvin, their killers. God didn't just die for the sexually harassed. He also died for those who do the sexual harassing. Grace is not the absence of justice. I'm not saying pedophiles should not go to jail. They should go to jail. Grace can forgive while I prosecute. Grace leaves no room for vengeance. For vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. Deuteronomy 32, 35. The hard thing about grace is how do you respond when God gives grace to people who have hurt you? Jonah says, I'm angry to death. I'm hot. Third and final unsettling truth about grace is it is revealing. If you ever want to Know the true condition of your heart. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? How do you respond when God says grace to people who have wronged you? Grace is like a colonoscopy. I've had one and it was no fun. They are invasive. They are uncomfortable. 
but they are necessary to see what's going on in, on the inside. If you want to know what is going on, the inside of your heart, get a picture right now in your mind of a person who has wronged you. Imagine God blessing them. But you don't understand, he cheated on me. I know I wasn't the perfect spouse. He cheated. He cheated on me. Committed adultery. I got a little something something out of the settlement, but I'm still struggling, struggling to get by. I just saw him posting on Facebook pictures of their brand new house. She wronged me, talking all about me like a dog. I just heard she got pregnant, and I can't get pregnant. That boss at that company made my life miserable, forced me out. My career has never been the same. That company now is flourishing and prospering. Jonah's reaction simply says he has got a racist heart. It also reveal, reveals he, has a, he is a hypocrite. Wait a minute, Jonah, God hasn't shown you grace? Now maybe he didn't bless you the way he blessed them, but are you trying to tell me God hasn't given you grace? In chapter two, you are dancing and praising God about getting out of the belly of the fish. Now two chapters later, you are outside the fish by grace, living by grace, but you want me to treat you as if you are my only child. If you really want to know your heart, how do you respond when God blesses those who curse you? The ending of Jonah is this. The Lord said to him, this plant grew up in one night and disappeared the next didn't do anything for it, and you didn't make it grow. Yet you feel sorry for it. How much more then should I have pity on Nineveh, that great city? After all, it was more than 120,000 innocent children in it, as well as many animals. Jonah 4, 10 through 11. This is, this is it. God asked all these questions, and that's it. That's the end of the story. The question is on the table. The question on the table is, how does Jonah respond? What does Jonah say? The book ends like a bad reality show. How do you respond when I say my grace is for everybody. It's not just for you, Jonah. It's for everybody. How do you respond? Sinclair Ferguson helps us out. Listen to what he says. Speaking of the book of Jonah, he says, it carries no conclusion because it summons us to write the final paragraph. It remains unfinished in order that we may provide our own conclusion to its message. For you are Jonah. I am Jonah. How do you respond to God's grace? There is no resolution because your answer, because you answer that question. How do you, church family, respond to the grace of God? Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for your grace, that gift that you give to us. Help us to accept it. Help us to grasp it and hold on with all of our life. Help us to be ready when you come. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins, creating us that clean heart 
and renew the right spirit within us, Lord. We ask all these blessings in Yeshua's most powerful, precious, and holy name. Hallelujah. Amen.